Uh, I'm Shauna Fleischbein with Castle Group. If you're not familiar with us, we are a full service association management company uh, throughout the state of Florida, and we specialize in condominiums and large scale uh, HOAs. And I'll be here to kind of keep an eye on questions today and, and send those over to, uh, to Ben and Adam. And so now I'll hand it over to you gentlemen and let you introduce yourselves and, and get the party started here. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to, uh, to Shauna and Castle Group for having us. Uh, my name is Adam Gurley. I'm one of the partners with Raven Parker Gurley. Here with me is my law partner, Ben Raven. Um, and we're here to talk to you about contracts generally and to talk specifically about Florida's construction lien law. And so to give you a little bit of background on, on our firm very briefly, uh, we practice exclusively community association law. So, so our representation is limited to condominium associations, cooperative associations, HOAs, um, the occasional 723 mobile home park. Uh, ben primarily does um, in, in this realm, in the contract construction lien law realm, contract negotiation, contract drafting, and I'm kind of on the, on the back end doing the litigation. So if something goes uh, poorly in connection with a construction contract, then, then that's really where I get involved. Um, so you'll kind of hear both, both, both sides of things here this morning. Um, move slides. So the agenda here this morning is section one. We're going to go over a, a summary of the construction lien law. We'll talk about what it is exactly and then Ben's going to take us through the forms and the timelines and, and the requirements that the associations should be aware of in connection with a, a construction project. Then we'll talk briefly when we get into contracts about the essential elements of a contract. We won't make this a law school seminar, but we'll touch on, on the basics and what, uh, what has to be there for there to be a valid contract. From there, we'll talk about statutory considerations. What do the statutes say about what must be in a contract and what cannot be in a contract uh, and what is valid and not valid in a contract? And last, Ben will touch on, again, as the, the contract negotiator for the firm, elements that, that he sees that should be in a contract, specifically with respect to a construction contract and some things that associations should look out for. Uh, when you are reviewing a construction contract or you're working with your legal counsel in connection with review um, of a construction contract. So with that, we'll, we'll move to the, the summary of construction lien law. And what are we talking about when we're talking about construction lien law? Well, it's chapter 713 of the Florida statutes. So if we go through an hour here this morning and you just can't get enough of Florida construction lien law, uh, chapter 713 is where you want to go. You, you punch that into Google and you'll get the full text of, of the statute. Chapter 713, um, it outlines the timing requirements and the obligations for both contractors, subcontractors, laborers, material suppliers uh, to protect their lien rights. And it outlines what owners, in this case, owners being associations should do to protect their rights under, under the lien law. Uh, one important note about chapter 713 of the Florida statutes, it's a strictly construed statute. Some statutes in Florida law, they're not strictly construed. What do I mean by strictly construed? In 713, the timelines actually matter. They're strict timelines, you have to meet them. If you go a day over these timelines, there are, are repercussions. Um, some of the statutes, you know, you have 30 days to do X, Y, or Z, but if you, if you do it on day 35, uh, there's some leeway there. Not so with chapter 13 and the deadlines that we'll talk about here this morning. So it's critically important that you're working um, that you're aware of these deadlines, that you're working with legal counsel and making sure you're meeting these deadlines throughout the course of the construction project. So what is the purpose? We touched on it a little bit. The purpose of, of Florida's construction lien law, well, it provides contractors, subcontractors, material suppliers, and laborers with priority of payment, but it also protects owners, the associations from liabilities beyond the contract price. So uh, let's break that down. First, it preserves the contractor, subcontractor, material supplier, laborer, and their lien rights if they don't get paid. Florida legislature has said that's um, you know, of supreme importance. We want to make sure contractors are being paid for the work that they're performing and subcontractors, et cetera. But it also protects, again, the association's rights, protects the association from making sure you do not have to double pay. Uh, if you pay the contractor, you're not on the hook for having to then pay the subcontractor who the general contractor failed to pay. Um, so it protects both parties 
as long as both parties meet the timing obligations that, that Ben will talk about within the statute. The application of chapter 713 in Florida's construction lien law, when does it apply? Well, it applies to contracts for improvements to real property where the contract price is greater than $2,500. That's a lot of contracts. That's not a high number for, for construction projects. Um, and I think a lot of our clients are surprised that the number is so low and that the lien law applies to so many construction contracts, which means when you're, you're dealing with the contract for the improvement of real property where the contract price is more than $2,500, the potential recourse for a contractor or subcontractor is to place a, a lien uh, on association property. So it's high stakes in any of these contracts where the lien law applies. Um, so these, that's the threshold really where you wanna make sure that you're consulting with legal counsel, you're having your legal counsel review these contracts and, and walk you through any changes or revisions that need to be made. Um, I think it, it probably all contracts should go through legal counsel. But if not all contracts, any contracts for the improvements of, of real property, $2,500 or more. If you take nothing away from this morning, other than that, it, it's been a productive morning. Um, I can't tell you how many times from a, a litigation side of things, we have a client come to us after the fact and say, hey, this construction contract, uh, this construction project is falling apart. You know, can you help us? And we say, well, send us the contract. And we get a, a one page proposal with a couple signatures at the bottom with no real terms listed on there. Um, and that becomes very problematic when we're trying to then, you know, put the pieces back together. So uh, that's the application. That's when the lien rights for the contractor kick in. That's why it's important to have contracts, $2,500 or more improvements to real property run, run through your legal counsel. Um, we had a question come in, if you don't mind yep. interjecting. So uh, somebody Wrote, if a homeowner requests an official statement of account from a contractor, which I believe is a detailed list of charges, and the contractor fails to provide it within the specified amount of time according to state statute, does that nullify the lien and is it removed from the property documents? Well, yes and no. I mean, uh, yes, it can by strict construction of the, con of the construction lien law uh, there, it's not a, it's not a get out of jail free card either. There is such thing as an equitable lien and it really all depends upon, um, whether or not you're dealing with a contract, uh, that you're in privity of contract with the contractor or, or with, uh, uh if you're dealing with a subcontractor in, in connection with a partial or final payment. Um, I, I think probably it's, it, it, let us go through, Shauna, kind of hold those questions. Let us, let's go through what the documents are and what they mean. I think, you know, big picture wise, it, it's probably important to, uh, to go through that before we start answering specific questions like that. And the reason I say that is, I mean, big picture and, and, and what's up on, on screen right now, you know, these are the documents that you're going to, to encounter as an association um, or you should encounter in connection with the construction lien law. And we're going to go through each one of the notice of commencement, the notice to owner, the claim of lien, the waiver release of lien uh, on fine, on a partial payment and on a final payment, a satisfaction of lien if a lien is filed, the contractor's final affidavit, which is, it, which is sometimes that's right in time where you would want to demand a, a, a statement of account uh, that, that the, the question uh, related to, and then a termination of the notice of commencement. So, so let me, let me, let's jump into that first and then we'll hit some questions on the construction lien law. Perfect. Um, so the, the, first, uh, the first document that's important in construction lien law is the notice of commencement. So but as Adam indicated, um, you know, $2,500 is the threshold for improvements to real estate. Um, if that uh, criteria is met uh, for the association to protect itself, if you will, to take advantage of the construction lien law, uh, they need to execute and record a notice of commencement. And that notice needs to be recorded in the public records of the county where the, where the improvements are located. Uh, and then a certified, the actual uh, uh, recorded copy or the certified copy is then posted on the premises before anybody delivers the first material uh, or steps put on the, on the job site. Um, and if that uh, doesn't occur for 90 days, you got to start all over again. So as, as Adam indicated, 
This is a strict construction statute. The courts um, pay, uh, pay very close attention to timing. Um, so let's talk about timing for a half a second because anytime you're in, involved in a, in a contract for improvement of, of uh, real estate, that where the construction lien law applies, it's, it's critically important that somebody is maintaining a, a ledger, a log of what's going on. When did the contractor first step foot on the property? When were materials delivered to the job site? When did they leave, basically? Because you know, if someone's gonna file a claim of lien, we'll get to that. There's a certain period of time within which to do so. Um, so timing is very important. So if you don't have a, if the, if the prog, if the contract is of any significance at all, you really, I'm going to call it a project manager. You need to have a project manager, not necessarily a third party, depending upon the complexity, but somebody who's in charge of maintaining the log or the, uh, the ledger of, of timing associated with everything. So, and, and let's, let me, let me just address real quickly before we get into the documents uh, uh, themselves just sort of big picture wise. The association is in a contract with a contractor and that contractor has lien rights. And there's not a whole lot of hoops that that contractor has to jump through to place a lien on the property for non-payment or for an asserted breach of contract and non-payment. The real key to the construction lien law is making sure that nobody else can file a lien against the property because the contractor is, one, is the one who's securing the materials. The contractor is employing laborers and subcontractors. And those individuals, the material suppliers and the laborers and subcontractors are also protected by the construction lien law. And they've got to file their own documentation here. So if the association complies with the construction lien law, by first recording and posting this notice of commencement, which when you go through it, it talks about the, the name of the association, the description of the improvements, the real estate that it relates to, any surety information if, there's, if, the, if the project is bonded, um, who, uh, own, who notices uh, should be delivered to in addition to the, to the uh, association. If they, if they end up doing all that and the subcontractor or material supplier does not comply with its obligations under the construction lien law, then they don't have a, they, they can't get a lien against the property. And, and their sole remedy will be to go against the contractor with whom they are in contract. By the same token, if they comply with what they're required to do, then the association has to protect them during the course of the, of the uh, contract administration and make sure that they are paid at the same time that the contractor is paid. So let's go through what they are. So the notice of commencement, as I said, gets recorded in the public records and gets a certified copy, gets posted on the job site. Um, it, it lets everybody know that the association intends to be um, uh, bound by and take advantage of uh, both those terms, uh, Florida's construction lien law. Uh, the improvements have to begin the, the first person has to set foot on the property or, or materials delivered to the job site within 90 days, or we have to go through that through those motions again. The notice has to be signed by the owner. Originally, it was always the owner owner, but now the law was changed a number of years ago and it could be the owner's authorized agent. So, so we do see property managers sometimes signing these things. Um, all right, so the, let's go to the next slide. The next, the next document is called a notice to owner. This is a document where the subcontractor or material supplier says, hey, Mr. Owner, I'm out here. You've got to protect me. I'm giving you notice that I intend to be bound by and take advantage of the protections of Florida's construction lien law. And it gives an information upon uh, who they are, how to get a hold of them, and, uh, and lets you know that they are, are, are intending to um, to be paid when the contractor is being paid. They are required to serve this on the owner by certified mail for no later than 45 days from the date that they step foot on the property or provide 
the materials to the property. That's the first time we go back to the log that needs to be maintained. If it's 46 days, no lien rights will ever apply to that particular subcontractor or material supplier. Um, so it's the first document, if you will, that, that is, is the most obvious of the critical importance of keeping a, a log, uh, a calendar of, of events that are taking place uh, on the property. Uh, the next document is the claim of lien. If a subcontractor or a material supplier, and the same with the contractor, but again, they're in a different category because they are, you're in privity of contract with them. But if they believe they have not been paid properly and they've complied with Florida's construction lien law by providing the notice to owner and serving it as required by the, by the statute, um, a, a subcontractor or material supplier or the contractor, are, they are entitled to file a claim of lien against the property. And in order to do so, they must file that claim of lien, record that claim of lien and serve it on the owner no later than 90 days from the last date that materials were supplied or, or uh, work was undertaken by substantial work was undertaken by the individual uh, uh, filing the claim of lien, recording the claim of lien. Um, so what happens in the case of a, of a condominium or homeowner association? The claim of lien is filed. Let's take a condo, the, the most uh, clear example. That claim of lien attaches to the common elements. That claim of lien attaches, if you will, to everyone's title because in a condominium, individuals, uh, own the common elements indivisibly with all the other owners. Uh, Adam, why don't you, let's take a, take a shift here for a minute and talk about the impact on associations with a claim of lien. Okay, yeah, this is a, a good time as we talk about the claim of lien. So now we're talking about where a contractor has said amounts are, are due, material supplier, a subcontractor, labor provider, um, and they're saying we haven't been paid and they actually record the claim of lien against the association property as Ben said, uh, more so in the context of a condominium where it's recorded against a common area property. Uh, what are the association's options? What, what can the association do at that point? And, and mostly when we come up against this, it's not just a situation where the association said, well, I don't feel like paying the contractor. Um, it's because there are, are defects or issues associated with the work. Either, again, the work's not been completed or it's not been completed to the association's satisfaction. We have defects and deficiencies. So our client's saying, you know, look, we have $75,000 worth of repairs to make because your work's defective. We're not going to pay you the full amount. Contractor says you have to pay the full amount and they, they record a claim of lien for the full amount. So now we're in this, in this dispute. How do we navigate uh, the claim of lien? Well, there's a, a few options initially. So first note that the claim of lien has to be recorded within 90 days of the last time that the, the contractor, subcontractor, et cetera, provided services or provided materials in connection with the project. So they have 90 days from that point to record their claim of lien. That sounds cut and dry, but it's a little bit of a moving target. And that's what keeps lawyers employed because you can argue over, well, you know, when they came out to do an inspection of their work, was that actual work performed in connection with the project? So um, it's not always as clear cut, but 90 days from the last time they furnished materials or uh, performed work out there. Then the, the lien is generally valid for one year. They have one year to file a foreclosure lawsuit to foreclose on that lien. What can the association do at, at that point? Well, you can send what's known as a notice of contest of lien. It's basically a, a formal letter. Um, there's a, a template in, in chapter 713. And you're putting the contractor, I'm just gonna say contractor, you know that I mean subcontractor and on down the line. Uh, it's letting the contractor know that now the timeline for them to foreclose on the lien has been shortened to 60 days uh, rather than a year. So if they're going to foreclose on this thing, they have to do it in 60 days or they lose their right to do so. They lose that lien, essentially. Uh, the second option, if you want to be more aggressive, is you file what's called a complaint to show cause. You file that in state court. Uh, and that 
fast forwards the time frame to 20 days. So now you're really pushing the envelope. Um, the contractor has to file suit to foreclose on the lien within 20 days or they lose their right to do so. Let's say the, the contractor files the foreclosure action within the time period that they have, whether it's one year, 60 days, 20 days, um, they go ahead and they file the foreclosure case against the association. So now there's this lien on the property and we're going through litigation that could take a, a year or more and the lien's just sitting there encumbering you know, the, the, the property and potentially affecting owners from selling their units out there, selling their lots. Uh, what are your options? Well, the statute 713 provides two options. I think one is, is a realistic option, the other less so. Uh, we'll start with the less realistic option, at least in my experience, and that is, um, well, let's backtrack. So your option is to transfer the lien to a, a separate security. You can do that by transferring the lien to a bond. You contact a surety, an insurance company. You go to them and say, we want to secure this construction lien bond, and the, the surety will issue that bond, and now the lien has been transferred to the bond. As a practical matter, we've seen very, very few sureties that are willing to issue these bonds, and the ones that have been willing to do so, the cost of the bond is typically so high that it doesn't make business sense to, to secure the bond. Um, so I don't know that we've had a client in some time go that route. The second option provided under the statute is you can pay money into the clerk of courts registry, and that will do the same thing. It'll shift the lien from the association's property, and it'll shift it to the security, this money that's been paid to the clerk. Now, that's easy enough to do to pay these funds to the clerk. The clerk holds the funds during the course of the litigation. If the contractor wins, the clerk will issue whatever amount that they're entitled to from the amount in the registry. And that's how they protect the contractor. That money's sitting there waiting. The clerk will disperse it to whoever wins the lawsuit. Um, the, the problem with that course, if you want to call it a problem, is it, it's, it's not cheap to do because you not only have to pay into the registry the lien amount, you have to pay the clerk's fees, you have to pay 25% or $1,000, whichever is greater, 25% of the lien amount to the clerk as well. And that's to cover the contractor's attorney's fees in the event that they win. So you end up having to, to pay a good chunk of change even above and beyond the claim of lien amount to the clerk in order to bond that amount off. But, but those are the two statutory remedies that you have to transfer the lien to an additional security. Um, two other options that aren't in the statute that are just more you know, common sense options. You can choose to, to pay the contractor, pay them the amount in dispute, and then you carry on with your lawsuit in connection with these defects and try to recover a judgment against the contractor whenever the, the case ends. The, the obvious risk there is you're, you're paying the contractor. They could dissolve as a corporation, file bankruptcy, whatever. You may never see that money again, um, but that's an option. You can pay and then the lien goes away while you fight about the defects. Or as a, a last option, you can just let the lien sit there. Uh, we've had clients who have had great difficulty with a lien recorded against their common property, their common elements. Um, this was a condominium and the owners were unable to sell their units. The title companies uh, were taking issue with the fact that there was this lien and, and owners were all up in arms because they couldn't sell their units, understandably so. We've had another condominium community here recently who uh, had two or three units sell in the last few months, notwithstanding the fact that there was uh, this construction lien on their property. So um, that's the, the final option, I would say, is just, just wait it out, go through the litigation and, and see if you can work out a settlement or see how the case is resolved at trial and the lien you know, just hangs out there. And if it's not causing anybody any trouble from a financing standpoint, the association isn't trying to get a loan somewhere, so it's not impacting the association there, then you can just let it hang, hang out there. But those are the options uh, once the lien's been recorded um, and, and you have to deal with it one way or another. There's usually a lot of pressure on the associations to, uh, to remove the lien uh, because any individual who is uh, trying to sell or someone is trying to buy, uh, you know, your title insurance uh, uh, commitment is going to require satisfaction of that lien or 
or you know they they will not take a uh, give a mortgage or or permit the sale uh, to go through uh, with clean title. So uh, those are those are options uh, that have to be considered. Um, so a claim of lien gets filed and uh, the first payment is due under the contract or under the draw schedule. Uh, and what the association has to do is it's got to secure a waiver and partial release of lien from everybody who you know is on the job, who's provided you with a notice to owner. So at that point in time, the contractor uh, not only brings to you, presumably, a sworn affidavit of, of the amount of work that's been completed, the amount that's now claimed due, but you know, he or she or it will be providing you with a, a waiver and a release of lien on partial payment from every subcontractor or material supplier who has provided the notice to owner. Um, if you make payment to the contractor without securing the waiver and release of lien, from any contractor or, or material supplier who's provided the notice to owner, that particular payment is deemed improper. And what does that mean? That means if you end up calculating the amount that the association has to pay under the contract. So in other words, the, 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 the remedy for a breach of contract uh, by a contractor is in, in, in general terms, the, what it would have cost you to get the job done had he or she performed. So if the contract goes awry and you end up getting liens on the property and eventually having to settle out, you've not completed the, the project. If the dollars to complete the project exceed the contract sum, that's your, your remedy against the, the contractor. If you made payment to the contractor without securing partial and final releases of lien from the subcontractors and material suppliers, those payments are deemed improper and they don't count toward the amount of money that you've got to spend to complete the project. In other words, you are, you are limiting your ability to secure um, uh, the appropriate damages or remedy, uh, depending upon how it all, all rolls out at the end uh, from, the, uh, from the contractor or limiting what you'd have to pay to everybody who is properly filed a notice to owner. So this is a document that you get each time the contractor is paid. Uh, this week we had a, a contractor say, uh, well, you know, I didn't have to pay uh, my painter uh, or my, in the case of, of what we just had, or this uh, window installer, anything. The windows have already been installed, so they're, they're no longer required to, to be paid. And, and they didn't do any painting in this last, uh, uh, between the last draw and now. Um, so I don't need to provide that release of lien from them. And, and that's not true. The waiver and release of lien is, is critically important um, each time a payment is made to the contractor. So we start off with, with waiver and releases of lien on partial payment, and eventually you get one on final payment. Uh, this way you've taken care of the obligations under the construction lien law to the subcontractors and material suppliers. Uh, what's the next slide, Adam? Satisfaction of lien. If the lien has been recorded, as Adam indicated, there are a number of ways to try to address the, that lien, but ultimately you wanna get a satisfaction of lien recorded against the property uh, so that lien is no longer a cloud on title. Notice to owner is not a cloud on title. A, a claim of lien is a cloud on title and that will prevent uh, an individual from securing either a loan or, or being able to convey uh, property with title insurance uh, uh, free and uh, clear from that lien. Um, at the time that you make payment to the contractor in his final payment, you want to require the contractor to certify to you that uh, his contract has been, uh, uh, that he's fulfilled his obligations under the contract to all subcontractors and material suppliers you want to make sure that uh, you have a sworn affidavit from the contractor that everybody has been paid in addition to the final uh, releases and waivers from the subcontractors and material suppliers. This is the document that you secure from the contractor. This document is attached as a sworn statement is attached to the next document that Adam is going to hit. Hit the slide. The termination of notice of commencement. Why do we record this? This is something that, again, the association actually uh, prepares and records. And it basically says 
the project that the notice of commencement related to initially that we've recorded in OR book and page, whatever it is, that project is complete. We're terminating that notice of commencement. Um, individuals, title companies, uh, banks, whomever are looking at the, the public records, you need not concern yourself anymore with respect to, the, uh, to this project. You attach to this document at the time of recording the contractor's final, a copy of the contractor's final affidavit. Uh, and that ends a particular uh, a, a particular project if all if all done correctly. So I know we had a we might have a couple questions here, but the question at the start of the documents that maybe we didn't hit head on was this sworn statement of of accounting, and that's where you go to the contractor who has these lien rights and you say, you know, hey, t tell me how you arrived at this number. Give me a breakdown. What were your materials? What are you? What are the services? Uh, what are you what are you charging for because there are limitations on what you can include in a claim of lien it has to be actual materials furnished rather than lost profit so you're entitled to a breakdown of, of what they're claiming in this claim of lien um and i think it's it's um 7 13 uh, 16 that uh, that addresses this and it does you know it says if they don't timely give you this statement of accounting then they've lost their lien rights um, but all throughout that statute where it says, here's what they have to provide, you know, the materials that they provided, the work that they did, everything's caveated with if known, if known. Um, so in theory, the statute says they, they lose their lien rights. As a matter of practice, I don't know that I've ever had a scenario where that has been uh, effective in terminating the lien. There's, there's for a strictly construed statute, that's one part of it where there's there's some wiggle room or some creative argument or a good lawyer on the other side is gonna say, you know, hey, we, we, we didn't have the full accounting yet. Uh, this is what we had. So we included it in the claim of lien. Once we get our full accounting, we might amend the claim of lien and then submit this statement. And a court may say, you know, okay, I'm not gonna strip your lien rights on, on that basis. So. Uh, just like anything else in the law, it's strictly construed, and and these deadlines are strictly construed. That statute has some built-in leeway, in my view. And uh, again, I, I've never gotten to a point where I've been in court and arguing that sole issue. Um, so I, I don't know anecdotally, but I, I can tell you, I think that's one that's that's easy to to dance around. Maybe not easy, but one that can be danced around. Well, and, and I, I think uh, the point that I was trying to make earlier is, you know, courts are, are courts of equity, of, of, of fairness. And while strict construction of the construction lien law is, is a requirement or the judge would get appealed, for example, and it might be overturned on appeal, you know, the, the, the fact that a, a, material supplier or a subcontractor or a contractor, they, they would still have the opportunity to get what's called an equitable lien against the property. They may not be entitled to attorney's fees and costs because the, the, for the statute, the construction lien law provides for a prevailing attorney's fee and costs, uh, but that does not necessarily negate the possibility of a lien against the property. And we did have a few more that will uh, questions before we move on to the next section. So um, Annie was looking for some clarification, um, Adam, on the 25% of lien or $1,000 that you had mentioned. Um, yeah, so that's in connection with the amount that you have to pay to the clerk to transfer the lien to the, the money you've deposited with the clerk. You're transferring that lien to, um, to a separate security, which is your payment to the clerk. And the payment to the clerk has to be, it's the full claim of lien amount plus 25% of the claim of lien amount or $1,000, whichever is more. So that's typically gonna be the 25% um, because very rarely is, is a lien recorded for, for less than that, but it's possible. We know the thresholds, you know, 2,500 bucks. Um, and then there are some additional clerk, uh, clerk fees that they charge on top of that. So that's the, the breakdown. And if you go to the clerk, they'll they'll give you a full cost summary if you show them the claim of lien and give you the cost summary that they would need. Um, I think, don't quote me on this, that the clerk fees may be adjusted based on the total dollar amount. I may have that wrong. Um, but anyway, the clerk will, will give you, here's what you're gonna have to pay in the registry to make this thing go away. So you can have that hard and fast number in front of you before you make the call. And like anything, I think there's three years of interest on there too, if I recall correctly. But like anything, you know, the 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 party uh, 
to whom that would endure in terms of the, the benefit, meaning the contractor, whomever says, okay, now I can at least not have a pot to go after. Um, they can increase that. You know, they can, they can move the court to increase that at any time. And we, we had a case that went on for a couple of years and the contractor went back to the judge and said, look, the security that's there is no longer adequate. Our, our attorney's fees alone have exceeded whatever it was. And, uh, and, and they made application to the judge to increase the amount that was required to be placed with the clerk uh, in connection with the, with the uh, movement of security. And that's something that the judge can, can address. Um, and Angela asked, uh, if a contractor fails to foreclose on a lien within the specified amount of time, according to statute, making the lien invalid, can a contractor refile the lien over? They cannot refile the lien. The lien will expire. But that doesn't mean the contractor doesn't have a contract right against the association based upon breach of contract. So that doesn't mean the obligation goes away. It means that the, the clear right to a claim of lien under Florida's construction lien law goes away. And if I was that contractor, you certainly are going to proceed under the written contract for breach of contract. And perhaps, as I've indicated, try to secure an equitable lien if they can show, you know, uh, grounds to the judge to, to consider that. But for the most part, the lien is gone. But the contract right the obligation under the written contract remains for, you know, at least well, under a written contract for five years. Okay. We have uh, two more here. Let's see. Annie um, asked, in an HOA where association is responsible for roofs, walls, driveways, et cetera, would a contractor lien block unit sales? Well, it's, it's not so much what the association is responsible for maintenance wise is what the the lien attaches to and that is association uh, owned property um and so that's that's going to be you know again we've had one community this was condo where they weren't too concerned about the lien and maybe that'd be the case more uh in an hoa where there's not uh you know common elements the shared property but um you know the the whether or not the title company is, is takes issue with that lien is, is kind of a separate I, outside of the legal realm. Yeah, I, I think it can prevent it. I think, you know, don't forget the association is is complying. If, if they're complying with the construction lien law, they are filing a, a notice of commencement in connection with the property that you know, they are authorized to, Im, to improve. So, yeah, I, I think that the, that particular owner would be should be concerned about a lien attaching to their particular uh, lot or unit. Okay. And Stuart is asking if you recommend performance and or payment bonds. You know, they're, they're very expensive and not every contractor can obtain them. Um, certainly on a job of, of, uh, of significance with high dollar amount, we, as a lawyer, of course, we're going to recommend that the association um, uh, require the contractor to uh, secure a performance and payment bond. It's usually, you know, three to 5% of the contract sum. Again, not every contractor can do it. And, and that's not necessarily a panacea either because, you know, like any insurance company, just like your home insurance, your car insurance, you make a claim against the surety, they're, they're going to defend and they're going to try not to pay uh, just like the contractor would. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, I think any lawyer uh, would be uh, uh, foolish not to recommend a performance of payment bond if, there's, if the job is significant. All right. Well, that wraps up that section. So if you guys want to start section two, I think we're good to go. All right. Perfect. Thank you, Shauna. Oh, thank you. Uh, we'll move on. Section two, our essential uh, contract elements. What, what does it take to create a contract? And again, we'll give the, uh, the big picture here. We won't, we won't dive too far into the the nuances that again are, are what keep uh, lawyers employed fighting over over some of these nuances but um, you can see the the list there generally the elements to establish a contract and we're talking both written contracts and oral contracts you have to have an offer you have to have acceptance uh, you have to have mutual assent meeting of the minds is the the law school term that you'll hear over and over again um, and sitting in those classrooms which is the parties intended to come to an agreement and be bound by this agreement. Uh, and then there's consideration, meaning 
one party actually has to give something to the other. There has to be this, this mutual consideration. Uh, two separate issues, and we're going to look at these a little more specifically. Uh, these aren't elements to a contract, but two other things to keep in mind is capacity. Did the individual have capacity to enter into the contract, the individual or entity? Um, and legality, is it a legal uh, contract? Is it an enforceable contract or does it violate the law? So looking at these a little more closely, we have the, the start of the, the, the contract dance, and that's the offer. The promise one party makes to the other for their services. We're all pretty familiar with, with the concept of, of making the offer. Um, but with the offer, it has to be a concrete offer. It has to be made with the intent to communicate and propose some kind of uh, agreement. And so that offer has to include certain essential terms. Um, typically, that's it has to include a, a firm price. It's not an estimate. It's not a proposal subject to change. It's, it's firm pricing. Um, even if it's not a, a set in stone dollar amount, the breakdown of how the charges are to occur, how the pricing uh, will be calculated are, are specific in the contract. What's the scope of work, uh, particularly in a, any vendor you know, service contract, but in a construction context, what's, what's the scope of work? Again, it doesn't have to be right down to the to the type of nail that the contractor is going to use, but it but it has to be specific enough to to satisfy this essential term you know requirement. Um, what's the timing? You know, if there's timing for completion, or when's the project going to start? Um, and there's no hard and fast rule that it has to check every box, but it has to have enough sufficient uh, essential terms that uh, it's deemed a a true offer. And again, not a not a proposal or an estimate. Once we have the offer, does the other party accept? Do we have acceptance? And that's again, when the other party agrees to perform their side of the contract, um, their, their obligation under the contract. Mutual assent is really just the combination of what I just said. One party makes what's a legitimate offer and the other party accepts those terms. The acceptance is not a, a counter offer. You're not going back and saying, I agree to this part, but the price needs to be you know, 10% lower. Now we're in negotiations. We don't have mutual assent. Um, but if there's the offer and that offer is accepted, we have mutual assent. Typically, we'll have a, a signed contract then where they put pen to paper. But sometimes we have these arguments that there's an oral contract, which is valid under the law, a quasi contract where one party started to perform the work and relied on, on what everybody believed to be a, a contract that just wasn't in writing. Um, but we have this mutual assent the parties, there's the meeting of the minds, like I said. Consideration um, of a contract and consideration just means that the two parties are actually exchanging something. So it can't be a, a contract if I promise to give Shauna a thousand dollars for nothing in return. There's no mutual consideration. Um, so therefore there's no contract and I haven't been bound to, to pay that thousand um, dollars. I'll take it though. Yeah, so, <laughs> and that was You're not offering. an offer. That was not an offer, nor was it accepted. Uh, no consideration. So I am not obligated to pay Sean a thousand dollars. We've all heard that. Um, capacity. So again, this isn't uh, an element of a contract. It's more a, a consideration, but it's the presumed ability of a person to understand the terms of the contract. They understand their obligation under the contract. They understand the consequences or repercussions if they don't honor the contract. Um, you know, the prime example is, is when we're dealing with minors, um, they lack the capacity to, to understand all of those things and are generally not going to be bound um, by, by a contract given their lack of, of capacity. Where this really becomes important in a community association context is when we talk about apparent authority. And that's where we have typically a president or a vice president who might uh, enter into a contract with a contractor on behalf of the association, despite the fact that the board never approved this contract. It never made its way to a board meeting and was never formally approved through the appropriate corporate formalities. The, we have a rogue president or vice president who signed this thing with, without approval. Um, an apparent authority means essentially where the other side to the contract, where the contractor in this example has no reason to believe that the president or vice president did not have that authority. 
they're entitled to rely on that apparent authority, that assumed authority. So um, you, your president or your vice president may very well be in a position to bind your association, despite the fact that they didn't observe those corporate formalities and obtain majority board approval. And, and the association would have to honor that contract, whatever recourse you might have against the president or vice president, it's a whole separate conversation. Uh, but you might not be able to get out of that contract under the, the idea or legal theory of, of apparent authority. Legality, um, does the contract violate the law? Uh, we have an example here, gambling contracts are illegal. Um, if, you're, if your board hires a hitman, you know, the court's not gonna uphold that contract if the hitman doesn't do uh, what they were hired to do, the contract's illegal. So um, there's the legality provision. You'll see in a lot of contracts, it's almost boilerplate at this point, where it says, if any provision in this contract is deemed unenforceable or illegal, the rest of the contract still survives. So if there's a illegal provision, an unenforceable provision in there, we still all agree to everything else but that unenforceable provision kind of as a layer of protection against this legality element or if the court deems one particular section of a contract unenforceable. Um, I don't know that legality becomes a, a, a prime issue in a lot of contracts we deal with, but uh, again, something to, uh, to consider in the context of, of contracts. Um, we're staying in the, the contract theme with, with section three here, and that's the, the statutory considerations when it comes to, uh, to contracts. Again, we've been talking in the construction lien context about construction contact, um, construction contracts, but, but we're talking more broadly now about contracts in, in general with, with vendors and, and other contracts that associations find themselves entering into. Um, certain contracts must be in writing. So contracts for the purchase, lease, or renting of materials or equipment to be used by the association. And all contracts for the provision of services must be in writing if they cannot be fully performed within one year. Um, so, you know, there's, there's even nuance to, to this, the question of whether it can be completed in one year. Um, you know, somebody has to make payments for 15 months to satisfy a lump sum obligation. Well, technically they can make lump sum payment. It can be completed within one year, um, despite the fact that they have the option to make payments over time, depending on how the contract is worded. So, um, again, it's a, it's another area where the facts will determine the application um, but, but generally speaking, if it can't be performed within a year, it has to be in writing. Obviously, it's a good idea uh, to have all of your contracts in writing, um, if not running them through legal counsel, but uh, that's not always the case. And so sometimes these oral contracts can be voided on the basis that they don't comply with these statutes here on the slide. They're not in writing. The next statutory obligation is that the, the contract for the services may have to be competitively bid. Uh, Mr. Rabin, you wanna field that one? Sure. Uh, well, as, as indicated here, it, in, in all three of the most common statutes that uh, we regularly deal with, the condominium, HOA, and cooperative statutes, uh, certain contracts have to be competitively bid. The test is whether or not the, the contract sum uh, exceeds, in the case of a condo, 5% of the total annual budget uh, including reserves. In the case of an HOA, that's 10%. Uh, then the, the contract has to be competitively bid. Um, there is no requirement to take the lowest bid. That's one of the misnomers, if you will, about the competitive bid requirement. They just need to get bids. And uh, in the case of uh, um, the, the websites that are now required to be maintained uh, in certain uh, circumstances, you know, those bids. Uh, either some the bids themselves or a summary of those bids that they exceed $500 uh, need to be included on the website uh, in connection with the executory contract. So um, uh, bidding is a, is a big deal uh, for associations and it, it, obviously it makes sense. Now there are exceptions to bidding requirements as you see on the screen, uh, emergencies where there's only one source of supply in the county, uh, employees, the big three A's, attorneys, accountants, architects, they're exempt from the requirements CAM managers, engineering firms, and landscape, and landscape architects. So there are some exceptions, but just like Adam's comment on uh, contracts and writing, you know, best practice says you get competitive bids on any contract that uh, 
the association is entering into. All right, sticking with the theme of, uh, of, of contracts, um, and this will be for, for Mr. Raven, who again does uh, the drafting of contracts for our clients, the negotiating of contracts for our clients, whether construction or otherwise. Um, so Ben, what are, what are the elements that you look for in, in contracts for our clients? And well, they're, they're, they're laid out in this, in this slide. And, and as you said, at the beginning of this seminar, if there's any, if there's one thing they need to get out of it is that, you know, keep in mind the construction lien law applies to contracts for improvement of real estate, which exceed $2,500. This is the second, perhaps even the most important, uh, item of the, of the presentation today is desired elements in association contracts. I don't know how many times uh, in, a, in a given week that we are asked to uh, review a potential breach of contract issue where the contract that the association entered into was the one page, two-sided pre-printed form, you know, called bid or something uh, that was prepared by a, a contractor and the association entered into that contract without considering whether or not time was of the essence whether there were defined performance, performance dates. Um, I can't stand automatic renewal provisions. It's an actual, it just bugs me to no end when contracts have that. Uh, we, we always try by addendum uh, or negotiation to eliminate automatic renewal provisions. Um, if, if the association wants to protect itself in connection with increased fees, then you give yourself the option to extend the contract. Give yourself an option not an automatic uh, renewal provision. Um, obviously, there needs to be protection for construction liens that's included in, in contracts where construction lien law applies. Um, insurance requirements, including workers' compensation insurance, a, a big issue that so many associations overlook. You need to have defined insurance requirements and make sure that the contractor um, or the, the individual performing uh, the contract uh, either has a work com workers' compensation policy or minimally an exemption. I don't like exemptions. I, if, if we're asked, uh, we don't we don't want uh, anybody performing that that is operating under an exemption from the construction lien law requirements of the state. Um, maybe a defined damage provision, uh, not as important as some of the other, but it certainly helps. Um, remedies for breach of contract, kind of the same thing. A clear termination provision give yourselves the right to terminate when certain things occur. That's never gonna be in their form contract, okay? So we wanna, we wanna address that. Do we wanna give the opportunity of a right to resolve it with certain notice and then the right to terminate? Those are issues that need to be negotiated at the front end. Uh, attorney's fee to the prevailing party, a huge issue in the state of Florida in a breach of contract case, well, even in statutes. If it's not, if the prevailing party attorney's fee is not provided in a contract or provided in the statute that applies, such as the construction lien law, you're not entitled to get your attorney's fees if there's a contract dispute. Um, so that needs to be included in, in every contract. And let me um, jump on, on that one. Notice provision and obviously venue. Uh, I don't know. We get handed a lot of contracts uh, by statewide operators and, you know, venue lies in Orlando. Um, and, you know, we're over here in, in, in Pinellas County. Uh, uh, so you wanna address what court would require it. So these are, these are things that need to be considered in any contract. Um, and uh, like I said, I, I think that's probably, if the, maybe the most important takeaway from today's seminar is to, to make sure that these issues are included uh, in any contract that uh, that the association enters into. What I'm seeing a lot with the attorney fee provisions and contracts that uh, the contractors uh, prepare, it says the contractor can recover attorney's fees if they have to file suit to collect unpaid amounts due. Well, there's a principle of law that says a contract cannot provide prevailing party fees for one party and not the other. So it has to be a two-way street. But where these contractors now have, have modified their contracts, um, they limit it to lawsuits where they have to collect their money. So now the fee provision only applies where they have to go collect their money. It doesn't apply where the association, generally speaking, depending on how it's worded, courts have held, it doesn't apply to defect cases. So even though you might have this, this two-way street, They've limited the scope of the prevailing party fee provision so significantly 
that it only benefits them anyway. Um, so that fee provision is critically important because if there's a, an issue, you know, construction defect litigation is not inexpensive. You need experts to prove your case and you might end up with significant damages, high five figures, six figures in damages. And it just doesn't make sense to pursue it because of the cost associated with pursuing it. And there's no prevailing party fee provision in the contract. And you're almost stuck uh, where the contractor, you know, calls the association's bluff and says, well, they're not going to sue for 100000 if they have to pay 60000 in litigation costs. And often that ends up proving to be true because the cost benefit of litigation just isn't there. Um, so again, that, that fee provision is critically important, not just that it exists, but that the language of it is appropriate to protect the association. All right, well, we had a few questions that have come in. Um, Stuart is asking, how does an association deal, or deal with owner an owner that wants to use contractors that provide the lowest price or a one person company, i.e. are exempt from workers' compensation? Well, a lot of times the association has no authority to, to decide what contractor an individual can use. If he's talking about an owner, then you know, there would have to be some rules in place. Um, and so the, the association would need ample rulemaking authority. Uh, and uh, if it's uh, something to be done specifically inside the unit that doesn't affect the common elements, uh, good luck. Um, but if it does affect the common elements, the association can adopt specific and defined rules that relate to uh, what would be required in connection with the contractor. Um, the workers' compensation issue is a little bit tougher to address because a contractor who properly has obtained an exemption from the state workers' compensation requirement is, is a valid uh, contractor, meaning they are permitted to work in someone's uh, home um, without providing workers' compensation insurance. And the association is not going to be in a position to force that issue typically. So um, the association is permitted to carry what's called a minimum premium workers' compensation policy. That's our term. I'm not sure what the real term is, where um, that policy can protect the association from from claims that might be made uh, by a contractor under those circumstances. It, it's, it's a little too complicated to, to get in in this, in this particular setting, but basically rulemaking authority, uh, and particularly if it addresses uh, in any way the common elements, people coming on site, uh, but the association should check with its insurance provider and, and see what, what I've referred to as a minimum premium policy is available to the association to protect from those circumstances. Okay, and we have one more. Um, does a CAM license give a manager the authority to sign contracts for an HOA without approval from the board? An authority is not in the contract between the CAM and the HOA. And before you answer that from a legal standpoint, I can tell you um, <coughs> Castle's um, best practices, none of our CAMs are allowed to sign contracts, period, point blank. It must have a <coughs> member signature on it. Um, but I don't know. Do you guys have thoughts on that? Um, I can't speak for other management companies, but do you guys have any thoughts on that? Well, there's nothing in the law that gives the CAM uh, authority to do so. Um, so it would depend upon the, the and, and I don't want to get specific. It sounds a little like a specific question <coughs> that relates to that individual's circumstance, but it may or may not be in the contract. Um, and then there's always the issue of what, of what we'll call a parent authority, where uh, an individual may be able to uh, present a case that it was, excuse me, it was reasonable for them to rely upon the fact that the CAM had authority. Generally speaking, CAM should not be signing contracts. All right, perfect. Well, we are we are at our end here. Oh, wait, we had one. I was going to say, ask now or forever hold your peace. Uh, Annie just typed uh, one in. Um, if hypothetically a signs a roofing contract calls for I'm having trouble reading this one sorry okay Annie I'm sorry I'm not quite 
able to read your question. Sounds a little, it sounds a little specific. The, the hypothetical sounds like it might actually apply to their circumstances. Yeah. So you're a little wary about answering that anyway. Yeah, sorry, Annie, but you can reach out afterwards and maybe we can help you on that. But yeah, I'm having a hard time reading that one. Um, but gentlemen, thank you so much for, for joining us today. This was fantastic. I'm sure everybody found it very informative um, because this is something obviously we run into all the time. So thank you so much for you know the great presentation. Um, as I mentioned, we will be sending uh, an email out uh, probably in the next day or so that'll have a link to this presentation along with Ben and Adam's information. So you guys can reach out to them specifically. Um, and you're getting thank yous in the in the Q and A here too, gentlemen. So um, so we appreciate your time today. Thank, thank you, Shana. We, we appreciate thank the opportunity. Thank, thank you to Castle Group. Thank you for everybody who attended. It's a little bit of a dry topic, but as Shauna said, it's an important one that uh, that we come up against a lot. So thanks everybody uh, for having us. Absolutely. Thanks, well, everyone, thank you for joining us, and have a wonderful afternoon. You too. Take care.